following network. Brewing with Style is brought to you today by Northern Brewer. And there are a bunch of badasses over there. This is the Brewing Network's Brewing with Style, hosted by Jamil Zanishev and Mike Tasty McDowell, along with special guest Jonathan Plise. Now, here's Jamil. Hey, howdy. Hey, my brewing brothers and sisters. Hey, home brewers. Uh, good to all see you out here at the uh, National Home Brewers uh, Conference in Philly. 2013, an excellent event. Uh, and uh, great thanks to the HA for that. And great thanks to our sponsor, Northern Brewer. Northernbrewer.com. Great, great ingredients, great prices, great people. Uh, especially thanks to them. A little extra thanks for being such a big sponsor of the Brewing Network anniversary party last night. So uh, very cool to have them uh, sponsor the show and be here. You can hit their booth later on by wandering around. Uh, they're just back over that away. All right, today we're going to be talking about uh, Dortmunder Export. I don't know uh, how many people out here have ever brewed a Dortmunder Export. One, two, three. <coughs> Oh wow! Very few, very few. See, it's a, it, and I, I think one of the things is it's a, not a well-known style. I think, uh, Tasty, you've brewed Dortmund. I have brewed uh, Dortmund and dosed it with peach extract peach, too, as uh, I recall. I, I am noted for doing the uh, peach extract, <laughs> the uh, peach Dortmund infusion. Yes, I. Uh, you, you get a gold medal in the nationals with your uh, Dortmund. I, I think peach. I've won a gold and a. I've, I've won twice in the second round with the uh, uh, Dortmund. Right, right. So, I'm both proud and embarrassed about that. <laughs> Mostly embarrassed. That's it's a good. I actually won once as a Dortmunder without the uh, peach. Well, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, that you should be proud. Uh, of. That I am proud of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, well, and uh, you know, what's what's your thinking on Dortmunder as being uh, uh, as a style, as a drinkable style? I think I people like don't it. they don't know uh, you know what it's all about. I've I've brewed it uh, and served it in uh, environments where. Uh, I knew there was going to be a lot, of, a lot of wine drinkers, and, and that there were going to be a chance to get introduced to a beer that they might like. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I, I considered it to be a beer, uh, at least brewed with the Bach 833 yeast, to be a beer that has a lot of like, wine kind of character to it. All right. Yeah. Well, and uh, if you guys all stick around, we're going to have some uh, commercial examples that we're going to taste here. We're going to taste the uh, Einger Yar 100 and the uh, Great Lakes uh, uh, Dortmunder Gold. Uh, they're two classic examples in the BJC, BJCP style guide, and uh, we've got them here today, and we're going to pass them around to at least some of the folks here in the crowd, and uh, we're going to taste them as well, and we'll all talk about why one is a great example of the, why, why something's a great example of the style or not, and uh, you'll get to experience that with us here. Yeah, the uh, BJCP style guide uh, talks about Dortmund or Export as, you know, Low to medium hops and, uh, you know, noble hops can be a little grainy, can be et cetera, et cetera. Generally, the, the takeaway from that is almost like a bigger uh, Pilsner. So you've got your, your German Pilsner, you've got, you know, your Hellas malt character, you've got your uh, uh, hoppy Pilsner kind of character. The two of those combined into one balanced, bigger, fuller you know, uh, Pilsner, just, you know, it's not just, uh, it's hard, <laughs> hard to explain. It's like pornography. You know, you, you know it when you see it, you know, you know, that's a good door reminder when you see it. Uh, you know, the BJCP style guide talks a lot about, you know, minerally and sulfur and all that stuff. You got to be careful that, um, you know, when you, when you brew this, I've, I've run across a lot of people that have added a lot of, uh, uh, water treatment to their, their Dortmunder, and it becomes undrinkable. And they add that because, you know, the, the style guide says, oh, it should be minerally and sulfury and all this <laughs> other stuff. And, you know, uh, be careful about, about those sorts of comments. You take them with a, a grain of salt, not a tablespoon of salt, right? Yeah, those uh, style guidelines uh, are, have those phrases in there that sometimes uh, throw you off in the wrong direction, yeah. Right, they take people kind of, yeah. kind of on the wrong direction, right. out to uh, you know, uh, out, out to weird directions. Uh, 
Yeah. And, and Dortmund is one of those. I think it's it's a difficult style to understand, but you know, just look at it as a as a bigger, you know, fuller Pilsner. Again, still balanced. You don't want to go, um, you know, something that's intensely hoppy or intensely bitter or, in, you know, overly uh, sweet. That's one of the things about the style guide. It says in here, um, it talks about uh, sweetness. It talks about uh, finishing. The hot bitterness lingers in the aftertaste, although some examples may finish slightly sweet. Um, you know, slightly sweet is, is perhaps a good, a good description, but... I think a lot of times people have consumed, um, you know, older, more stale examples that have like, suffered some staling from being in the package, being shipped uh, across the water, and the hops drop out. Hops drop out very quickly. Bittering drops uh, rapidly over time. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, so the beers will seem sweeter than they really should if you were to drink them on draft in Germany you get a different character then in the bottle six months down the road. So uh, they can appear sweeter than they really should be. So you want to be careful of not going down that, that sweet road. Right. Yeah, it's a beer that you really want to attenuate really well. And, uh, yeah, like Jamil saying, uh, the, the better versions, I think, are like, it's, you know, 6% ABV and below. Although it's a style that could support, you mm -hmm. know, a bigger gravity. Uh, Dormunder. Is one of those beers that I brewed at a high gravity and uh, and diluted to right. to serve and uh, it, you know it, you can you can make and I've tasted it at like eight percent and it's it's a pretty good beer. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we're not talking uh, box strength here. We're no. talking you know uh, yeah. again still Pilsner strength, but you know more malt character, more. Uh, yeah, it's got more kick. It's the daddy of, of not Pilsner. dry and uh, you know more uh, refreshing as. Uh, a regular German Pilsner would be, or yeah. you know, just uh, the malt focus of a Hellas. Right. Now, uh, Moscow, have you ever had a Dortmunder? Or uh, probably without knowing, maybe. But yeah, probably. <laughs> I, I, it's called Dortmunder because the town of Dortmund or the region of Dortmund, oh, Germany. So maybe that's why I the tend northern, to stay away from part, him, you know. <laughs> yeah, because it sounded German. Right. <laughs> is, that, is that it? Uh, well, yes. and. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, a lot of times people wonder, you know, thinking, well, this is an ad advanced beer to brew or something like that. Uh, you know, the only only tricky part, I think, in brewing a, a good Dortmunder is fermentation control. You know, you need to have the temperature control to do a lager. But I think you can make a, a pretty nice Dortmunder uh, from extract. I think that's possible. What about this style lends itself to, to working well with extract? Um, it's a fairly simple uh, malt bill. You know, I think you can get some good, uh, you know, Pilsner-based extracts out there. So, so given that it's light like that, how, how low can you go with the ABV? Uh, you know, I think the style got somewhere around like 4.8 to maybe 6, something like that. But, but Tasty, you said 8 is the higher end? Well, I, just, I, was, I was making high-gravity beer. No, I wouldn't 4.8 make... to 6. How about 6 that, 6% folks? would be the top. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's good. Yeah, about 6%. But they're better like I'm at 5. I'm proud of myself. Hey, you get a little pat on the back. That here? was pretty good. That was good. A little pat on the back. A little pat on the back. There you go. See, I got to count on Moscow. Tasty can't be I'm bothered. not even paying attention. Not paying attention. Uh, it lists IBUs as 15 to 25. SRM as 2 to 6. So you're starting gravity 1046 to 1056, and you're finishing gravity 1008 to 1012, giving you an ABV of 4.6 to 6%. Uh, the... Uh, let's see here. Commercial examples, uh, DAB export, uh, Dortmunder Union export, Dortmunder Cronin, Eyinger, uh, Yar 100, uh, Great Lakes Dortmunder, those are the two that we have. Uh, Gold Barrel House, uh, Dortmunder uh, Bell's Lager, uh, Dominion Lager, Gordon Beer, Gold Export, and Flins Flinsberger Gold. Are any of those that common? I mean, they don't really sound all that familiar. Uh, you know, out on the West Coast, we get some of these from Germany, um, and we get the Eyinger, uh, and we get the Gordon Biersch every once in a while, I think. Um, Dan's brought that to the studio before that. Yeah. Uh, and out here, I went to a local bottle shop and was able to find those two. So, uh, you know, it, it's not something that you see everywhere, but, uh, you know, in a good bottle shop, you should be able to find find some examples. 
Let's see. They talk about the flavor. Neither pills malt nor noble hops dominate, but both are in good balance with a touch of malty sweetness, providing a smooth yet crisply refreshing beer. Balance continues through the finish. The hop bitterness lingers in the aftertaste. Uh, clean, no fruity esters, no diacetyl. Some mineral character might be noted from the water, although it usually does not come across an overtly minerally beer. Medium body, medium car carbonation, overall impression, balance, and smoothness are the hallmarks of this style. As a malt profile of a Hellas, the hop character of a Pils, and slightly stronger than both. Uh, their comments brew to a slightly higher starting gravity than other lagers, providing firm, malty body and underlying maltiness to complement the sulfate of ex accentuated hop bitterness. The term export is a beer strength category under German beer tax law and is not strictly synonymous with the Dortmunder style. Beer from other cities or regions can be brewed to export strength and labeled as such. Uh, in style indigenous to the Dortmund industrial region, Dortmunder has been on the decline in Germany in recent years. Uh, ingredients minerally water with high levels of sulfates, carbonates, and chlorides. Uh, noble hops, Pilsner malt, German lager yeast. All right, let's do this. I'm getting thirsty. So I suggest we take a, a short break, and while we do, uh, we can pour ourselves samples. We can get the crowd here some samples. You guys want some beer? Yeah, yeah that's what I'm talking about. All right. All right. So Let's we'll, do this. we'll take a short break and have some beer right after this. And now, Northern Brewer presents What If Homebrewers Ruled the World? Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll follow me, I will lead you into the gallery area. Now, the first piece up for sale today is a Jamil Zena Chef original, a bottle of 1997 vintage Evil Twin. Oh, I see. A bidding for this one-of-a-kind piece will start at 7,000 pounds. And if you'll continue to follow me, ladies and gentlemen, I can show you a rather abstract piece from Bay Area brewer Justin Crossley. It's a German Doppelbach entitled Justin's Giant Bach. The brewer's notes here indicate that this beer had excellent mouth food. Capital, capital. That's just a crazy dream. Or is it? With Northern Brewer, a thirsty nation can craft its own ale and lager for the greater good of mankind. Northern Brewer, the home of superior customer service and the finest selection of home brewing goods for the future. Nico, listen, our lawyer said that we had to do this for one hour, and after this, we don't have to talk to each other for three more months until the, the next meeting. Kids. Come on, let's get out of here. I'm supposed to have more lines. I'm the professional. <clears throat> Hey, it's Sully. And I'm Nico. And we opened the 21st Amendment 10 years ago at 563 2nd Street in San Francisco, just two blocks from Giants Park, to make great beer and have a great time doing it. That's right, because to us, the 21st Amendment is more than just the right to make beer. It's the right to experiment, to be innovative, and just do things differently. And so now, we're putting our craft beer in cans. That's right, cans. You can find our world-famous Hell or High Watermelon Wheat Beer at Brew Free or Die IPA in the Northeast, Northwest, parts of the Midwest, and Alaska in cans and on draft. So next time you're at your local neighborhood pub or good beer store, be sure to ask for 21st Amendment in cans. Because everyone likes it in the can. Tasty Crack Cans. Tasty Crack Cans. Hi, I'm Jamel Zanishef, and in addition to my work on the Brewing Network, I write the style profile column in every issue of Brew Your Own magazine. Hi, I'm Sean Paxton, and when I'm not prepping for the Home Brewed Chef on the Brewing Network, you can find me writing articles on how to cook with your home brew for Brew Your Own magazine. Greetings, cretins. This is John Palmer, and when I'm not writing for Brew Your Own, I'm reading it. John Palmer, Sean Paxton, Jamil Zanishev. If you love listening to them on the Brewing Network, you'll love reading their articles, tips, and recipes in the pages of Brew Your Own magazine. Join Jamil, John, and Sean eight times a year in Brew Your Own. And when you subscribe to BYO on the Brewing Network website, half of your subscription price goes right back to the BN to support great beer and food programming. So sign up for Brew Your Own magazine through the BN website today so you can listen and read your way to better homebrew. When I order a beer, I want my server to know more about it than I do. I want someone who enjoys good beer and loves helping others enjoy it too. I want someone who knows how to pour a perfect pint for every beer style. I want a Cicerone. 
The Cicerone Certification Program is creating the type of people who help you enjoy great beer. Home brewers and craft beer lovers know beer is more flavorful and complex than ever, and it takes some serious knowledge to store and serve beer right. Cicerone's No Beer. There are three levels in the Cicerone Program. Certified Beer Server, Certified Cicerone, and Master Cicerone. Cicerone's are truly the sommeliers of beer. The best beer locations have a certified Cicerone on staff. Relaxed and unpretentious. Cicerone's are tested on storing and serving beer, beer styles, flavor and tasting, the brewing process and ingredients, and pairing food with beer. Learn more about your next beer guide at Cicerone.org. Certified Cicerone, because it takes top talent to present a perfect pint. For nearly 15 years, home brewers have been served by one place in Michigan where you can buy yourself a serial killer. Adventures in Home Brewing. Did you try all those great Michigan beers at the National Home Brewers Conference in San Diego? Adventures in Home Brewing delivered. Did you see a great false bottom in your buddy's cooler or brew kettle? Adventures in Home Brewing delivered that too. And did you see that great custom brew stand? Yep. Adventures in Home Brewing delivered. Since 1999, Adventures in Home Brewing in Taylor, Michigan, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and online at homebrewing.com has been serving home brewers from the right coast. Check out their innovative 2.5 gallon keg with metal handles, great homebrew kits, and the fully adjustable anodized aluminum serial killer grain mill. Visit them in Philly for the 2013 National Homebrew Conference. Not going to make it? Check out all the fun of adventures in homebrewing at homebrewing.org. For a limited time, coupon code BNETWORK will slam 10% off your order. Join the adventure online at homebrewing.org. And don't forget to use coupon code BNETWORK for a limited time. Now back to Brewing with Style. All right, we're back. We're here live at the NHC in Philly. You guys having a good time? Oh, yeah. Now we passed out some uh, Great Lakes Brewing Company Dortmunder Gold and some Eyinger Jahr 100 beer. Uh, these are both listed in the BJCP style guide as uh, classic examples of the style. What's your impression, uh, Moscow, you're, you, of, of Dortmunder as a, as a style and of these two beers? I go first so I don't get tainted by your expertise. Yes, you yes. The, the I don't want you. Answer? I don't want you influenced by my taint. Yes. Well, it'd be hard to do, but I think that the. Well, the, first, the, the color's really different, right? The, the Ainger is really light compared mm -hmm. to the Great Lakes. Uh, almost looks like a light lager, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's sweeter. And I get, I almost get, oh man, I almost get like a s smoke flavor from the Great Lakes. They're really different. And I, I, it, do you get smoke at all or am I just dreaming? Yeah, I got yeah, that. Yeah. What does that come from? There's no, obviously, smoke malt, right? Um, I don't think they use smoke malt in there. Um, smoke is a, a phenol, so um, you know it can be related to a lot of things. Um, it's interesting to me that you find the Eyinger to be sweeter than the Great Lakes. Because? Uh, I'm not sure I would describe it as sweeter. <laughs> this is why you need to go first. That way I can well, sound like I know what I'm talking about. You're not supposed to know what you're talking about. So when you do, that's what's weird. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, as far as sweetness goes, I would describe them as different. I, I think that the, the Great Lakes is coming on with a, a bit of an upfront malty sweetness, you know, almost yeah. a crystal malt or maybe, maybe a slight staling uh, sweetness. And uh, the Eyinger's coming across with more of that Pilsner malt, almost candy, Pilsner kind of sweetness. But it's crisp and dry still. Uh, they're both fairly crisp and dry in the finish. Um, I, I was taking a look at the Great Lakes beer, and um, one thing I didn't notice when I picked it up, but I noticed now, it says, uh, please enjoy by uh, June 4 of 2013. So we're not too far past that, but, you know, it, it's probably going to show a little bit of age just because of that. You know, that's, that's just to be expected. It's part of bottled beer. But the uh, Eyinger, I think, is, uh, is in pretty de decent shape. I'm, uh, what does, do you folks in the, the crowd think of these two beers? Um, which one would you say is sweeter? Uh, anyone that says Eyinger is sweeter? You see how they listen to me? Uh, anyone that says that the Great Lakes is sweeter? Anyone that says they're pretty much equal but different? 
You should have you should have taken a vote before you stated your opinion. <laughs> no, no, no. I like to win, uh -huh. so I always uh, make sure I state my opinion first, so people can agree with me. What's the what's with the difference in color? Why, why is there such a big difference? Well, again, um, you know, some of it's going to be recipe. Some of it's going to be, uh, you know, it might be a little bit of age. But, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering if the Great Lakes, it seems to me almost, um, I mean, maybe they're using a certain kind of Munich malt or something like that, but it almost seems a little crystal-y, like uh, they're using a, a, a crystal a light, malt or like a caramel Like a light malt. crystal? Would you... Uh, also, I'm, I'm getting uh, not getting a, a real lot of uh, Pilsner character out of the Great Lakes beer. Uh, no. I just got either all or a fair amount of pale malt. Right, yeah, I don't really get a whole lot. I get a little bit of background, like Munich. I, I, yeah, I think the Munich, there's definitely Munich's, some Munich in there. Yeah, definitely. That's what's probably where it's getting its color, too. That it Probably it doesn't have any specialty malts. There's a fair amount of Munich in the base. Now, what's your take, Tasty, on, on these two? Which, which one do you think is, um, you know, do you think they're both good classic examples? Do you think, uh, you know, one, one's better than the other? What's, what's the yeah, reasoning I, here if, on, for you? Yeah, if I was uh, judging Dortmunders, I would, I would I'd throw the Great Lakes out. I think it's not within the Dortmunder style as far as what I know that style. And mm -hmm. what I, mm -hmm. You know, what I've tasted and brewed, no, definitely it's, uh, the anger is more of a, uh, to me, of a, as a bigger Pilsner character that I'm looking for in a Dortmunder. Yeah, I, it, if I was to, you know, pick one over the other, you know, as far as, you know, style and all that, I, I would go with the Einger as well. The Great Lakes, um, a, a nice beer, but uh, really missing that Pilsner character, really missing, um, you know, that, that, that kind of uh, crispness. And again, some of that might be just because we got an old sample, but um, a, a, a little too sweet up front for me with the, the kind of the, the crystal caramelly. I, I certainly wouldn't put them side by side in the style guide. No, no, I, I can't. It's hard to imagine they're in the same uh, same section. All right, now uh, who you know, just as a beer that you like, which one would you drink more of in the crowd? Would you drink more of the Great Lakes? Raise your hand. You drink more of the Einger. Yeah. And the Einger, and then a bunch of people that have no idea what we're talking about or and no can't, hands. can't raise the hand, or they have no hands. All right. <laughs> And how many of you have no hands? Oh, no, yeah. well, fortunately the, nobody. They didn't. They, nobody raised their hand for that. For the folks no listening hand. at home, Iyengar was the winner of the hand raising. That's what most people yes. raised oh, their hands. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But not by huge margin. Uh, well, maybe three or four times as many. Yeah, maybe three to one. But we've got the crowd of thousands and uh, only uh, maybe uh, thousands, yeah. twenty or thirty voting. All right. Uh, and, uh, you know, by a similar show of hands, how many people think that the Eyinger is a better example of Dortmunder? And how many people think that the, the Great Lakes is a better example of Dortmunder? Nobody. All right. Well, they're on the same page as us. Well, I don't know. Moscow? Well, Moscow what do you, what do you, what do you think? think? Based on the, the reading of the style guide... What would you think? And you propensity to say what say what we want you to say. Well, I mean, it, it's true that, that the Einger really is much more pilsnery. Like it, ha yeah. It, it does. The Great Lakes doesn't have that pilsner character. It, it's the, it's replaced by that smoke I was picking up on. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I, I would prefer the, yeah, the Einger. It's still there. Yeah. Right. I mean, with that you get a uh, real full direct uh, pilsner character. It's got that. Initial Pilsner sweetness, but it dries out nice and crisp and dry. It's a full beer. It's got a lot of uh, you know hop character, but again, not overwhelming. It's balanced. I think it's an excellent example of what uh, a true Dortmunder is like. I could see it having a little bit more, perhaps, Munich character or something like that to kind of fill it out, make it a little richer, a little more full, a little more, a little more like a, uh, just rounded out slightly, but. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they know what they're doing. I wouldn't really mess with it too much. Yeah, they could even but, uh, put uh, in like a little Maris Otter, like a, a, a little bit of pale malt to, to give it more malt character. I've done that with my Dortmunder. My Dortmunder I made, I think was, uh, I might have been half pale malt and half Pilsner. Yeah. 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 And that's uh, certainly a possibility. Uh, yeah. You know, a good, a good recipe for this? What, what would a good recipe for this be? Well, it's, you know, it's typically going to be about, what, 90% Pilsner malt and then mm -hmm. uh, some specialty malt. I, I do like Munich or uh, right. maybe a little bit of white wheat, uh, you know, maybe just 2 or 3% uh, 
to help with clarification. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, you know, that's pretty much all there is to the beer. Uh, you just got to make it, you know, build it to the, to a, you know, a, a gravity that where you can uh, up with the, uh, you know, what you're trying to get in the end in terms of alcohol percent. Uh, and it's like most lagers, you got to start with a really uh, good sized pitch. Because you know you're going to be you know fermenting cold, so you got to make sure you, you know, aggressively uh, go after the ferment. Now, what uh, yeast were you using on your award-winning Dortmunder? I use I use the uh, Bach uh, 833 yeast the for that as well. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a great. That's a great. To yeast. me, that's the 001 of uh, lager yeast. It acts the same. It, I, it responds the same. It I can repitch it. Same mm -hmm. sort of thing. It's just a for a lager yeast uh, and for a, a Chico Ale brewer. It's just great. Now the thing I think is tricky for a lot of people when they're when they're brewing um, a Dortmunder is the recipe you've just described sounds very similar to what you might think of making a pilsner, yeah. right? If you're making you know a German pilsner, you know. Uh, so the thing that differentiates is perhaps mash temperature instead of going quite as dry, you're going a little fuller. Yeah. You're going with a higher mash temperature. You go, you may add a little bit more Munich malt than you would in a standard Pilsner. A standard Pilsner, just all Pilsner malt. You know, sometimes you add a little dash of aromatic or something for fun. You know, we're homebrewers after all. Uh, and then, uh, you know, a lower mash temperature, you want that thing finishing, you know, fairly light and crisp. Uh, when you're making the Dortmunder, you go a higher mash temperature, you go with maybe a little bit more residual sugar. You go with, uh, you know, a little bit more body. You can add a little more uh, Munich or other character malts. I'd avoid the crystally ones. I'd avoid the, the malts that are dark in color. I think that, you know, that kind of throws it off a little bit. And then um, uh, as the style guide recommends, a little bit of, uh, you know, sulfate, a little bit of, uh, you know, the, these mineral. You can, can add a, when you're going with a, uh, a, a fuller, somewhat sweeter start having a little bit of mineral character in there don't go overboard uh, a little bit of mineral mineral character in there can actually accentuate that that crispness of the finish right you don't want it so you taste it you want it more so it's a background note so again that's that's a difference on the pilsner the because your starting gravity, you know, it's it, it's a, a tad higher than your pilsner, but yeah, not really, but not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. And then uh, you know a little bit of Munich. The uh, and then as far as hopping, more than you would do in say a Hellas, you know, it's a much much more pilsner like on that, and you get this balance of hop flavor, malt flavor, right. uh, you know, the the mineral dryness with the the sweet sweeter start or fuller start. And, you know, a great balanced uh, but still crisp beer. Right. And I'd say that that's, that's, that's really key. You can use a lot of different uh, yeasts. Um, most of the German lager yeast will work, work quite fine. So if you're, you're thrilled with one over another, you know, you could stick with that. Some, the difference between the German lager yeast, a lot of people ask, is, you know, some of them give a more malty character. Some of them give a more hoppy character. Uh, if you ever get a chance, you go down to the White Labs uh, facility in San Diego. I know it's quite a distance from here, but people from all over. And they'll do uh, samples of, you know, they'll, they'll take the same wort and they'll ferment it with 20 different strains. And you can go in and get a flight with all these different strains. And you taste them, and you'd swear they use different ingredients in there. You know, it wasn't just the yeast. It's like, why is this one so hoppy? And why is this one so malty? Oh, they must have added, like, Munich malt or crystal malt to this one. And you, you'll just be blown away at how radically different those, those beers turn out. And that's, you know, yeast selection. So, uh, you know, even in something clean like the German lagers, it's, you know, some are more malty, some are more hoppy. That's probably the biggest, biggest difference. Some of the background characters are a little bit different. But, uh, you know, uh, very, uh, the lager yeast tend to have a fairly similar character. And you can, I think in this style, you can pick whichever one you like. Um, but interesting to do that kind of experiment. All right. Uh, let's take uh, one more uh, short break, and then uh, we'll get back to talking about uh, Dortmunder export and uh, hop selection of those. Back after this. BN Army, Hop Tech has a great discount waiting for you. Do you often find it difficult to find specific specialty ingredients for your homebrew recipes? Well, listen to this. 
Hop Tech stocks 59 different grains to choose from, 39 varieties of pellet hops, and eight kinds of whole leaf hops. And Hop Tech not only carries Y yeast and White Labs yeast for you, but also Fermentus, 04, 5, 6, 23, 33, and T58 Belgian yeast, plus Cooper's, Nottingham, and Windsor yeasts. Got your recipe ready to go? Pick up some great brew gear like new long and short sleeved shirts, games, and more. HopTech's new website is being updated every day with new items. If you don't see it, call the shop. They're open six days a week. BN Army and AHA members get a 10% discount, and active military personnel get 15% off. Visit HopTech.com today for great selection, great service, and a great discount. HopTech.com. I-10, huh? Getting tired of that same old handcrafted beverages day after day? Are you looking for something with more diversity than your normal beer? Fellow BN Army member Michael Fairbrother, owner of Moonlight Meadery, is reviving an entire beverage category. Mead! The meads at Moonlight Meadery are all handcrafted from the finest honey on the market and are perfect for any occasion, like weddings, baby showers, or... Excuse me? Mead is not your average girly drink, mister, and Moonlight Meads can be enjoyed anytime, anywhere. Football games with the guys. Yeah! Barbecues with the guys. Yeah! Operating power tools with the guys. Yeah! Um, actually, sir, that's really dangerous. Good point, son. Next time you have something to celebrate or are just looking for a new tasting experience, pick up a bottle of mead from Moonlight Meadery. Now in 21 states, making over 60 varieties of mead from dry, semi-sweet to sweet. Break out of that craft beer lull. Grab a bottle of Moonlight Mead. Can't find some? Then ask. No, make that demand some. Yeah! Yeah! That's it. I've had it. I am never putting hops in my beer again. What? Why? It's just too ridiculous. Insane prices, stupid contracts, high shipping costs, crappy selection. Dude, you need Nico Brew. Nico Brew will rock your f***ing face right the f*** off your f***ing skull. Five dollars shipping to all 50 states, plus fantastic international rates get you low prices on Nico Brew's great selection of hops and more. Whether you're a home brewer, a pro brewer, or a home brew shop owner, Nico Brew can get you the hops you need in increments big and small, single orders, spot buys, or full contracts. And there's only one place to join the uber special secret elite bare bones club where you'll get the best deals anywhere. Holy f***ing shit! NicoBrew.com N-I-K-O-B-R-E-W Nico Brew, your bare bones buddy in the brewing business. There's an app on the iPhone for just about everything, including beer, apps for finding a pint of beer, apps that look like you're drinking a pint of beer, and now there's an app for brewing a pint of beer. Introducing BrewPal, the most all-inclusive beer brewing app for professionals and hobbyists that fits in your pocket and goes wherever you do. Recipe formulation that can be imported and exported with a customizable database. Mash and sparge calculations, yeast pitching rates, carbonation tables, and more. Available right now for less coin than a pound of grain. See BrewPal in action at brewpal.info and download it for your iPhone at a special introductory price right now. BrewPal, all the brewing software you need right in your pocket. Hi, I'm Jason Harris, the proud owner here at Keystone Homebrew Supply. We're thrilled to be entering our 20th year of supplying this great industry. And to show you, the Brewing Network Army, how much we appreciate your support, we're offering you 10% off your first order on our website, keystonehomebrew.com. Just use coupon code BNARMY at checkout, and I'll get your order out the same day. My goal at Keystone Homebrew Supply has always been to have a complete supply of everything a brewer could want. When you place your order online or when you come into our store, it's It's our goal to have everything on your list and more. One aspect of KeystoneHomebrew.com that we're really excited about is the ability to fulfill customers' exact grain bills. Do you hate to wait? Keystone Homebrew Supply can get your precious yeast and hops to you within just one day if you live between Connecticut and Virginia and within two days east of the Mississippi. KeystoneHomebrew.com I'm Jason Harris and I approve this message. You're listening to Brewing with Style on the Brewing Network. Now. 
Now back to Jamil, Tasty, and Blise. It's Brewing with Style. All right, we're back live here at NHC Philly. Is the jet ski giveaway today? Yeah, I saw it out front. The jet ski is parked out front uh, here in the Chuk, Kill, whatever river. And uh, yeah, some, some lucky person uh, going away with a, a, a jet ski. Yeah, you said we could give away a jet ski. Oh, I'm giving away the jet ski? Oh, yeah, we're not giving away. You're giving away. Shit. It's blue. It's very beautiful. If it, Jamel been, says it, I'll do it. It's been parked out in front of the uh, Brewing Network studios for a long time. It's missing its wheels, just sitting on the rims. But uh, That's fine. <laughs> you know, up, on, up on cinder blocks down in, in lovely Martinez. So I think we had it uh, drug behind a trailer down here to Philly. I don't know why a jet ski needs wheels, but whatever. <laughs> That's a Martinez jet ski. You ever heard of that? <laughs> yeah, it's a scooter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Martinez jet ski. Don't try to use it in the water. Right. All right. Um, so one of the things, uh, Dortmunder, you know, Tasty, you and Doc just recently did a, uh, a fermentation experiment, lager fermentation experiment, using a Dortmunder base that uh, Doc had, had uh, produced. Uh, yeah, it's way on now. Uh, yeah, the uh, the project was based around uh, this fermentation fermentation uh, technique for loggers that uh, I picked up on one of the shows, uh, where the uh, you basically uh, brew, you uh, ferment it in two weeks rather than the traditional, you know, like five weeks, uh, which would include the lagering phase. And so what what happened was uh, Doc made. Uh, I think he made like 26 or 30 gallons of wort, and I took five and, and uh, fermented it my way, and he fermented the rest. I think in uh, he had two different uh, conicals, so he fermented, uh, split that into those into those conicals, and uh, then we compared the the result uh, in terms of like well, what what beer is is you know what is, what is the difference between the two week beer and the and the five week beer, and uh, you know we tasted it on the show, and we we're all we we're like pretty surprised how. Uh, you know, some of us actually liked the two-week beer better than, than the five-week beer, but they were, you know, we could we could all say that it was well, it wasn't even the people that liked the five-week beer, you know, would say that uh, it's only marginally better if at all. So, mm-hmm. just an, another way to to, to make uh, turn a beer around a little quicker, and, that, and that's how the, the uh, I don't forget the name of the uh, brewery that we were talking to on the show, but uh, that you know, that was their problem is they you know they'd like to do a lager because their customers were looking for that in the lineup, but they did, couldn't tie up the fermenter for that amount of time. It really affected uh, their whole lineup that they needed to, you know needed to make an IPA right after that. So once they shortened the the, the, the brew time, uh, they were able to you know to just mix it right into the regular rotation. Uh, and that's something I, th- I think uh, you know homebrewers could do, you know upon occasion, especially like now in the summertime when you want to make some lighter lager beers. You can you know you. you know, you know, we're all procrastinating and put things off and don't allow time to do it. It's another tech you can you can use, and especially if you're going to, you know, if it's a beer you're not bringing for competition. If I was, well, actually, the Dortmunders that I placed with were all all brewed the same way. So I, I guess that makes the case. Yeah, that the Dortmunder that I, I think I placed second in, uh, where was that? We were sitting uh, in uh, Cincinnati uh, with the Dortmunder, and it was. Lot, you know, it was fermented in two weeks. In fact, I, I, I'm sure I uh, rebrewed it for the second round. So, yeah, it, it, this makes a makes a lager like I don't know. There's the only difference I could I could tell, or nice, and that, as it's what I expected would be that uh, it has this kind of finer bu- finer bubbles kind of feel to it. Just it's more about how how it was, uh, you know, naturally carbonated versus when my two egg beer I, I force carbonate that. So that to me gave it sort of a different carbonation texture, but. You know, after you know, a few weeks of uh, you know just sitting and, and aging while Doc's beer was being, you know, fermenting and, and, and getting cleaned up, uh, it kind of mellowed itself. So when we tried them, like when Doc's was ready, my, you know, my beer was like you know fully conditioned, fully aged, and it uh, really you know fared well. Well, and you know, uh, if you go back to the uh, the original shows we we're doing, that's that's the way that I've always recommended doing loggers. Oh. Um, you know, competitions. I think it makes the best loggers to, you know, start at a lower temperature, 
uh, you know, let the, the growth phase be at a, at a lower, more controlled rate, yeah. uh, providing the proper nutrients and oxygen and pitching rate and all that. And then, you know, let that thing ramp up and, and let it let it go, uh, you know, a little bit more up and then towards the end, raise it again. Right. And uh, I've, I've been calling it like a modified Narcissus uh, fermentation. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I feel that that really makes the best lager. I, I'm, not, I'm not in on the really long, slow and cold or going hot and lowering the temperature. I've always railed against all that. But um, the, I think the, the real value to that is, you know, you're starting, uh, you know, more controlled. You, you control that growth phase, which is important to a lot of the precursors. Um, you know, controlling it too much can be a problem. Controlling it, you know, not enough can be a problem. And then, uh, you know, that ramp up, getting that yeast active, I think, you know, what happens is you get, you know, fuller attenuation, better attenuation, you get fewer off products left in the beer. I think you can get, uh, you don't want to go crazy on the temperature, but, uh, you know, a, a lager should finish, you know, let's say uh, your average ale is finished in, you know, five to seven days. A lager should be finished in, you know, 10 to, you know, 10 to 12 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't see, you know, a four-week fermentation is never a good thing. Yeah, to me, it's just slowing down the uh, the process, really. So if you're trying to clean the beer up, why would you want to do that at cold temperature? That just slows slows the, the whole thing down. So my approach was, and I, I, if I don't have my notes in front of me, and I, I might quote different numbers, but it generally was like I would uh, pitch it 55 degrees, and I would hold it there. Uh, until I was 50% to my tar terminal gravity. Then I would raise it to like uh, 58 until I was at 75%. Then I raised it to like 60, 62 or 60, oh, I'm getting into mid 60s I think, until I was 90% and then once I was at 90 I would let it go, raise it up to 70%. And then so that all just I happened over like a 14 day period. So it'd be like three days at, at 55, two days, and then it was basically two days at, at every step kind of thing. So when it was over, I was already done with the diacetyl arrest, and any by any uh, byproducts of the cold format have already been cleaned up, and so you know the beer was you know lager clean and ready to go. Now, I just had to carbonate and drink. Uh, got another question for you. Why do you think uh, peach flavoring extract was uh, a, 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 an award-winning combination with the Dortmunder Export? Well, like any. Uh, what was your reasoning there? Uh, well, like any fruit beer. Uh, you got to bring out something in the beer, the base beer, right? I mean, like, so I'd smell this Dortmunder, and it, it had, uh, you know, sort of a fruity character because it's it's got more esters because it's a it's a it's a bigger beer, and uh, uh, so I you know I was picking up either pear or peach, and uh, I went up to. Uh, well, and, and, and peach is a stone fruit, and yeah. and lagers tend to be a little sulfury, and those stone yeah. fruits tend to be reminiscent of yeah, kind yeah. of a sulfury, like a apricot and things like that. Yeah, exactly. There wasn't any other, no reason to add any sort of uh, any citrus to it at all. That 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 wouldn't have played very well at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but I went to uh, up to uh, my homebrew supply store, more beer, and uh, you know they're nice guys, and they let me you know try a few different ones before I bought it, and uh, they helped me try it. And they they threw their, I mean I. Did this uh, decision like a long time ago. So then I just took the, the decided on the peach, and I took that back home. And of course, I you know, Jamil was a mentor for me a long, long time ago, and he still is. And he you know he said, well, you, what you ought to do is just pour some in a glass and start, you know, adding a couple drops at a time, and roll it up, and when you and when you get to the point where you can just smell the peach, you probably got about the right amount. And that's what I did. You know, I just basically added until I could definitely thought this smells like a peach beer. And of course, then I tasted it. It didn't really taste like a peach beer, but that didn't really matter. It just because the beer already had a peach peach character to it. Well, and at the, I remember, you know, sitting there with you, and we were we were going through that, and and my reasoning on that was, um, you know, if you're entering competition and you want to win at competition, and you've said this is a peach beer, then when the judge smells it, it better smell like peaches. You know, that's that's the required level. Now, that may mean that, you know, there's not enough flavor or, you know, but the first thing a judge does is smell it. And if only, they only taste it, it's not going to do as well. If they smell it and taste it, then, and it's still in balance, that's the way to go. So you need to, you need to be able to, to smell it. So always, when you're dosing something or you're determining how much fruit or you're trying to figure out a balance on something, 
and you're and you want it to be a peach something or a bourbon something or whatever, you got to make sure that the judge can smell it in order for it to really have a stand a, a chance in a big competition like this. You, you, you really want to have that. Now, what about hop selection? Uh, you know, one of the things about um, uh, the Dortmunder, you know, I believe is, you know, you want to be using noble hops. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's a reason why uh, a lot of these brewers will, will look at noble hops and look at uh, certain hops. What if, what if you wanted to do something different on the hops and you know, maybe make an American Dortmunder? I, I can see Scott there. He's thinking to himself, I could make an American Dortmunder. I, th I think it's. I think it's. Uh, you can see the passion in his eyes for American Dortmunder. Looks like you got a window right into my mind. That's right. <laughs> uh, that big hole in, in the front of your head. All right. Let's do this. Let's take our last break, and when we come back, we'll wrap up. We'll, we'll talk about uh, hop selection for Dortmunder Expert right after this. Where do you go for all the stuff you need to brew? homebrewstuff.com of course in their Boise Idaho storefront and warehouse they have more than 750 craft beers and 8,000 square feet of homebrew products in stock the staff at homebrew stuff are homebrewers themselves they try out just about everything including the beer so they can answer your questions knowledgeably and correctly about brewing kegging and anything else you might need to ask don't live near the homebrew stuff store Visit homebrewstuff.com online and take advantage of their $7.95 domestic shipping available on most orders. Homebrewstuff.com is a proud sponsor of the AHA, NHC, GABF, and countless other acronyms. So if you're a homebrewer looking for great people, a great selection, and great deals, head to homebrewstuff.com online or in person. Visit their YouTube channel for loads of free how-to and product videos. All of the stuff you need to brew. Homebrewstuff.com Hey, my brewing brothers and sisters, this is Jamel Zanishef, and I love a bold, hoppy beer, one that spits resin in your face and makes you cry, Uncle. There are a lot of great hoppy beers out there, but at Heretic, we want to make something as bold, dank, and resiny as possible. We use hops at every chance we get, including multiple dry hop additions. The result is Heretic Evil Cousin. This light golden, 8% Imperial IPA has an easy malt character that helps take the edge off the mass of bittering, but it takes a back seat to the in-your-face hop character. We make sure this beer finishes dry so the hops can jump out and slam me in the taste buds. If you can't get enough hoppy goodness, Evil Cousin is your cup of tea. Cheers. A vial of White Labs yeast is the key to your best beer. When you open a vial of White Labs yeast, you're giving your beer its best chance for a perfect fermentation. In addition to their already incredible variety of yeasts, White Labs is proud to announce WLP 90, San Diego Super Yeast, now available year-round. WLP 90 is super clean, super fast fermenting, with low esters and has a neutral flavor and aroma profile. It's alcohol tolerant and highly flocculent. For more of the latest White Labs news, click over to whitelabs.com, where you can read reviews of yeast, learn in the lab section, and join the customer club. And if you should find yourself in San Diego, White Labs has a brand new training facility for craft brewers and home brewers alike. Whitelabs.com. Discover yeast, nutrients, enzymes, and more for commercial breweries, home brewers, and homebrew stores. White Labs. It's all in the vial. Do you know the three most important rules in brewing? Sanitation, sanitation, and sanitation. And no one does it better than Five Star Chemicals. Five Star knows sanitation. You can only sanitize clean equipment. And Five Star knows how to clean, too. For craft brewers and home brewers, Five Star has what you need to keep your fermenters, serving tanks, kegs and draft lines sparkling and free of any beer-spoiling bacteria. PBW, caustic, acid cleaners, star sand, Santa Clean, lubricants and defoamers, pH stabilizers, and more. Five Star Chemicals has cleaning supplies, safety supplies, heat exchangers, pumps, hoses, and valves. And Five Star is proud to offer eco-friendly products that exceed customer expectations. If you you have a cleaning problem, you need the Five Star Solution. Visit fivestarchemicals.com or call 800 782 7019. 800 782 7019 and get the Five Star Treatment today. In a world where everything has 
has been lost. What happened to the city? It's in ruins. Only one man has the ancient knowledge to restore civilization. Uh, I need a drink. Oh no, the liquor store's been ransacked. You looking for beer, stranger? <laughs> Boy, all the liquor got drunk up in the first 25 minutes of the apocalypse. Wait, there's still some bottles over... Oh, no. Those are non-alcoholic beer. <laughs> I reckon you better stick to arrowroot tea and a desperate nomadic oh, existence like the rest of us. People, I'm a home brewer. I know how to make alcohol. <gasps> oh, 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 it can't be done. Come with me if you want the beer. Okay, I'm gonna need some big plastic buckets. He is the chosen one. The prophecies say that he's gonna get us wasted. Someone start heating water. And then From the creators of Northern Brewer, the people who brought you massive selection and superior customer service comes the Home Brewer. You're listening to Brewing with Style on the Brewing Network. All right, we're back live here at the NHC in Philly. Hey! All right, we've got a crowd of thousands huddled huddled next to the the table here in the uh, in the. Uh, yeah, we need security here to print these people back a little bit. Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, they've been drinking. I don't know. Um, well, and we'll be doing shows tomorrow. Uh, John Palmer and I are going to do uh, Bruce Strong at 1230 and 3.15 on Friday. So uh, come on by, and you'll actually get to ask some questions, I think. We'll have, we'll have a microphone for asking questions and all that tomorrow. So be a lot of fun. Bring your brewing uh, questions, and we'll answer them all for you. And we we're going to talk about uh, hops for Dortmunder uh, before the break. And... Uh, one of the uh, things I think that is important is, uh, you know, the Noble Hop selection uh, for Dortmunder style. I think if you're going more American, I think the thing to do, you know, low cohumulone, you know, going with a, uh, a lot of people say the bittering from a high co cohumulone hop can be quite harsh and bitter. Um, so, you know, something low cohumulone. I, I would also focus on uh, going with, um, you know, Something along the floral routes, the spicy route. I wouldn't go uh, citrusy. No. I wouldn't go, you know, those common IPA hops, just citrusy or piney. I'd go floral, spicy, um, you know, Liberty, um, uh, Mount Hood, things like that yeah. are, are pretty good. Mm -hmm. could, could you just explain real quick what that term means? Low, 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 Cohumulone, whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's a, uh, you know, one of the... Uh, oils in, uh, you know, in the in the hops, uh, made of various compounds, and uh, some of those compounds have been identified with a harsher bittering character. So you just want to be careful about, you know, as you select your hops, they're all going to have different kinds of character. I mean, some people, you know, believe it very strictly. Um, some people think, you know, may not make make much of a difference. I think. Um, uh, you know, boy, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think, uh, you know, Matt Brindleson is very, very fond of going low cohumulone uh, and its importance. You know, he's very much about the different oils and compounds in the hop that, you know, make the character of the beer. And, um, you know, so, so looking at those analysis of the different hop varieties can be very important. But so the, the people that uh, believe that it doesn't make that big of a difference, they're, they're just wrong? It does make a big difference? <laughs> well, I don't know. It depends on, on how the beer turns out, you know. Uh, but, you know, generally the saying is if Brittleson says it's so, then it is so. Yeah. That's, that's generally how I live my life. That's true. <laughs> that's I think everyone true here should, should live their lives that way as well. I think it's, you know, are. yeah, <laughs> that's, that's pretty much, you know. If he says, you know, always wear your seatbelt, you always wear your seatbelt. That's, That's right. just how it is. Yeah. yeah. You know? All right. Gotta listen and, to somebody. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, in, in lager brewing, um, you know, there's, a, there's not a lot to hide a lot of other flavors. So in ale brewing, you have a lot of, uh, you know, esters and other compounds. You have, 
you know, bold hopping. You have a lot of, uh, you know, malt choices. When you're making a, you know, Pilsner-based beer, I mean, you're talking about something that's, that's you know, uh, fairly restrained, and you need to be careful about those kinds of selections. Same thing on, on, on your malt selections. So on a, the Dortmunder, a, how about, so, would saws work out, or would that be too too floral, too, uh, too aromatic? Check saws is, is a good choice. Right. A- absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I wondered about, uh, getting back to the fermentation, mm-hmm. why it ever was the case that it took so long. Like, I mean, given that the results are great from the short fermentation, mm-hmm. and it's, it just seems to be better in all respects. So why was it ever the, I know it's tradition that it's long longer, but why did it right. become that way? Right. Well, you know, during the summer months, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot more wild yeast and bacteria activity with the the increase in temperature, and so German brewing had migrated to brewing only in the winter months. They didn't want uh, people brewing in the summer and, and making these sour beers and funky beers, so uh, it moved into brewing in the winter, and they would brew through the winter, and then the spring would come, and what they'd do is store the beer in caves with blocks of ice cut from the river. And, and, and uh, that would, uh, you know, they'd store that over time, you know, essentially lagering it or cellaring it over time to drink throughout the summer months. So uh, that changed, you know, the yeast strain selection, things like that. And, and uh, you know, when you're, log- when you're fermenting in the winter, when it's cold, you know, fermentation goes slower. And, uh, you know, so they've, they've got these long fermentation periods. They've got these long storage periods. And that's how it, it really came to pass. It doesn't necessarily mean that's the most effective way to ferment a lager. Well, right. It's so, just uh, more, I guess, traditional. So why would you do it today other than, is there a reason other than just because that's the way they've done it? Right. I, I, I think if you were interested in figuring out why something, uh, uh, you know, how it would have turned out back in the day, you know, you start cutting ice from the river and storing it in your cave and, and doing it that way. I think that that's, you know... The, the, Home brewing, I think it's it's great that you can do stuff like that. But if you're you know interested in making the best best logger possible, I think you know there's other ways to modify that process and really really turn out the, a better beer. So yeah, good question, excellent question. All right, if you guys enjoyed this show, you can uh, download it from uh, thebrewingnetwork.com. You can uh, get these shows. We do these shows every two weeks, and we do Brew Strong on the uh, on the week uh, rotating from that. If after this you want to hang out with uh, Tasty, Scott, and myself, uh, have uh, book signed, pictures, things like that, uh, you know, kiss, kiss your baby, whatever, we'll be glad to do it. If you enjoy the program of the Brewing Network, make sure to check out our fine sponsor, northernbrewer.com. Uh, great folks. Uh, they'll really support you as well. And they're here at the, the conference. Go by and say, hey, thanks for sponsoring the, uh, the Brewing Network, uh, the Jamel Show. Uh, we really enjoy it, and uh, make sure that you check out all the fine things in the Brew Network store. And hats, goodies, and right, and right here. You go buy some stuff right here, and that all goes to the bottom line of the Brewing Network and helps stuff like this stay on the air. Until then, we're strong, everybody. And often. <laughs>